So I'm always looking for um, people that are doing something cutting edge and always looking for new solutions. So uh, we worked really hard on making a sulforaphane project, a product, which um, we're still tweaking. <laughs> and, um, but uh, Eric's going to talk about NRF2, um, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, and the beauty of um, sulforaphane, again, going back to not needing a bunch of vitamins, going back to the food being what contains what we really need to heal. So Dr. Balcavage. All right, thank you. All right, we're ready to go. Everybody ready? Yep. Yes. All right. So we got to talk about this stuff, inflammation, sudden stress. I mean, this is the, the problem of our times, right? We live in a world where we are constantly bombarded by inflammation and all these stressors that are driving inflammation and oxidative stress. And you read about it, you see it on the web, you see it on every TV commercial, take antioxidants, take anti-inflammatories. We've got to suppress, suppress, suppress. Uh, I just did a stem cell talk last night you know, to a group of arthritic people, and what do they do? What's the number one thing you, give, you tell arthritic people to do? Right? They take NSAIDs, that's the number one thing to do, which is probably the number one thing that they shouldn't be doing if they want to have a healthy stem cell system for the rest of their life, right? And NSAIDs just shut down your MSCs decreased function so it's one of the worst things they can do but we have everybody I saw on the big billboard on the way in like it was is it vitamin water right take this for your antioxidant support Did you see that because I go on a big billboard and I was like oh so anyway we've got all of these things that put stress and strain on the system drive uh, this oxidative stress which then we link to all these degenerative conditions and so the real question is how do we address these things. Do we just need to suppress? Do we just continue to take anti-inflammatory antioxidants? We just pound ourselves with those things and life will be good, right? The issue is, I don't know if that's the best thing to do because inflammation is actually key to healing, right? It's a really important part of the healing process. If you don't have inflammation, you don't do a great job of active, activating that stem cell system. You don't have a great ability to regenerate and repair. So we need inflammation. We need free radicals. So we need some of this. So uh, what's the benefit? You, you, just, you help get rid of some of the microbes, thereby eradicating infection. If you're constantly bombarding the system with anti-inflammatories, you're actually inhibiting the natural antimicrobial process. It helped these, these inf inflammation-free radicals help drive the detoxification of toxins, facilitates the healing process, and it repairs helps us repair our damaged tissue. So what's the, what's the downside to these excessive reactive oxygen, species, reactive, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, and inflammation? Well, we get damage to DNA and lipids and proteins. We see an increase of the blood-brain barrier when we have excessive amounts of these things. We have increases in the inflammatory pathways. We have increased degeneration and increased apoptosis. So we need some, but too much becomes problematic. So it's really about balance. So we have to figure out how do we balance the antioxidant system with the reactive oxygen system, right? So we have to have balance. It's not about just pounding the system with more stuff, which many of us would have been taught to believe that, hey, you just give enough anti-inflammatories, antioxidants, and everything's going to be good. And that may be potentially one of the worst things we can do for people. So there's a cycle, right? So if you, as, as oxidative stress triggers inflammation, inflammation triggers oxidative stress, and these things get out of control, that's what's driving much of our degenerative diseases. So how do we address the inflammation and the oxidative stress? We, I think all of us in this room, right? This is not necessarily what's taught in allopathic medicine, which is, hey, let's get to the roots, right? Let's get to those foundational factors. And those are the things that we try and help our patients with. They're not sexy though, right? Your patient wants to know, give me, just tell me what I can take. You want me to change my diet? Really? I don't want to do that. Um, but really, that's the number one thing to reduce the stress, remove the stressors. Kelly and I talk about that almost all, every time we talk it. What we're trying to help people with when we're talking about detoxification or anti-inflammatory or redox is all, they got to do the foundational stuff. And if they don't do this, you know, all we're doing is filling them with more and more stuff, which is essentially what allopathic medicine is often doing, is just giving them more. And we don't really want to do that with all of this stuff. It's just pound them with more stuff, because then we're just doing the same kind of physiologic whack-a-mole that medicine's doing, right? You got everybody remember whack-a-mole? Everybody remember that game, right? So uh, we can support with direct anti-inflammatory and antioxidant products. That's one way to address it, right? You can give them vitamin C, you can give them vitamin E, you can give them NAC, you can give them the direct antioxidants, you can give them a direct anti-inflammatory. That method can work. 
And we see that many times as part of our treatment protocols, right? We've all done it, me too. And then the other issue is to provide phytochemicals to amplify the innate defense of the body and, anti and detoxification antioxidant process. So uh, I really, my goal is really to favor this. The more I learn, the more I want to favor that versus doing the indirect. So I think it's about finding a balance because sometimes you need that kind of help to get that system shut down or calm down just so you can start helping them feel a little bit better and heal and repair. But long term, if we can use food and phytochemicals to actually help do this naturally, I think that's the best method long term. So a couple key concepts to think about. Everybody heard this term before, hermesis? Has everybody heard that term before? So yeah, some stress is good. You know, we try and shelter ourselves. No, no inflammation, no oxidative stress, right? And life will be good. But really, we need some of that stress. We need some of that inflammation. We need it in our life. We need it. I think I was talking to Melanie, right? We need the kid. She's talking as a teacher, right? She's, you know, we may want to shelter our kids so they don't see all the kind of nastiness of the world. But to some degree, we need that to condition them for the realities of life. It doesn't do you any good to live in this little sheltered castle and then have to get out in the real, real world. So we need some st mild stress. Mild stress is good. It preconditioned, that, preconditioned us, it gets us ready, right? We gotta, if we're gonna run a race, we gotta precondition ourselves, get ourselves trained up to be able to do it. If we don't have stress in our life, then when we do get some level of intense stress, more likely we're gonna have more destruction and not be able to manage it, okay? So this is an interesting or important type. So there's lots of different things that can have in a hormetic effect. Even the supplements that we provide people have a hormetic effect. Some is good, none, you know, none may not be great. Some is good and too much may be problematic as well. It's like the three, was it three little bears? Is that what it was? Yeah. So it's a three little bear story. So. There's somewhere though, there's this sweet spot, right? Where you find out that, hey, as I exercise and train, which is a great way to increase that mild to moderate oxidative stress, which helps us with healing and repair, then you get to that diminishing returns point and everything starts to go south, right? I did this to myself maybe five years ago, six years ago, I was still training for triathlons and marathons like, like I was 20. Right, staying up late, studying, training, and then I got my blood work done one day, and I'm like, I'm, I'm insulin resist resistant. I got Hashimoto's, and I'm like, what the heck happened, right? But increase, I was, I was, I, I was way, way past the sweet spot, right? And so I was thinking like I could heal and repair like I was in my 20s, and I, I just couldn't do that anymore. We talk about stem cells and the benefit of stem cells, especially young stem cells, can help us rebuild. When, when I was 20, you know, you could tear yourself down and next day, I'm ready to go, right? But when you're in your 40s and your 50s, you need a little bit more time for recovery. So we've got to find that sweet spot. And I think it comes through not only exercise, but all the things we're doing, especially when it comes to supplementation. Kelly and I were, were talking a little bit earlier about, hey, so we don't want to just overload people with support products. And we there's some tendency sometimes to do that. Well, if that didn't work, let's just give you Let's just keep maxing the dose right, until we get it. And that may have a more negative effect than a helpful effect. So homeostasis versus allostasis. Everybody who's familiar with those terms? Homeostasis is the balance, right? So when you've got balance going on and then we've got this kind of set point regulation system in the body, kind of like this guy on the little balancing board. Allostasis is when stress pushes us, and whatever those stressors are, physical, chemical, emotional stressors, push us out of that homeostatic state. We're out of that set point regulation, and now we've got to shift our physiology, shift our chemistry to adapt to that stress load. That's what we call allostasis, and if we don't adapt to it, that's when we get crushed, right? So a lot of what we see in the bodies in our patients isn't, in my opinion, it's not dysfunction, it's not disease, it's, it winds up being disease, but really what we see is an, ad, an adaptive response. Right, this allostatic response. So, two more terms: allostatic load. That is the load of stress that we put on the body that triggers the shift in physiology. Really important. We're going to talk about why that's important. So, that's like our truck being overloaded, taking more of a load than it can. And then, 
The disease we see is this allostatic overload. When you've got more load on the system and you start seeing systems break down, shut down, that's your allostatic load, okay? So key, good concepts. Most of, a lot of the model for how I think it's about patient care and what we're trying to do is based on Dr. Robert Navio's work. Does everybody read his paper? If you haven't read this paper, write this down. You need to read this paper more than once, right? Kevin's read it, I'm sure, right? And so this was my friend Ben Lynch, uh, as we were pre preparing for the first ShyCon conference, sent me this paper, and uh, he's like, you got to read this. And it was like, <sighs> and for, for those of you who haven't heard or, or seen me or know anything about me, one of my passions is thyroid physiology. And I think we have it wrong for much of what we do for people. We look at thyroid dysfunction as the problem. And I don't think it's the problem. Thyroid physiology is the adaptive response, okay? And if you read this paper, Dr. Navio talks about the kind of the eight, nine different things that happen when there is a, what we call a cell danger response. So I'll go through it quick. You have this cellular stress. It could be physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress, microbial stress. And essentially what you have is a drop in electrons an electron flow within that cell. That signals to the, the mitochondria, picks up that drop in energy flow, and then says, oh man, there's danger here. And the cell actually goes through a process to try now and protect itself and the rest of the organism, okay? So there's a series of things go on that go on. You have decreased oxygen consumption, and I think it's really decreased oxygen consumption for ATP production and really that oxygen that gets utilized really more for the reactive, reactive oxygen species. You see a shift in polymer to monomer, monomer synthesis. You see stiffening of the cell membranes. You see uh, the release of antiviral and antimicrobial chemicals. Um, increased mitochondrial fission and autophagy. You get change in DNA and histone methylation. You get mobilization of endogenous retroviruses lines. You get warning of neighboring cells uh, by the release of inflammatory chemicals. You get altered host behavior. So some of the things that you see in your patient base, everything you see in your patient base is really as a result of what's going on at the cellular level when there's this chronic stress response. So think about what goes on. You have a patient that comes in and they've got some type of infection or, or cellular process, some cellular stress, that activates the cell danger response. One of those things that happens in the cell danger response, I'll talk about this in a second, in my opinion, is that if you think about what happens with thyroid physiology, one of the first things that happen in the cell is the downregulation or deactivation of thyroid hormone. Not all of it, but a good portion of it. So T4 gets downregulated or deactivated to something called reverse T3. Is anybody familiar with that term? T3 gets deactivated to T2, right? So. Is that an accident? That's what triggers, what causes hypothyroid symptoms? At the end of the day, it's lack of T3 getting to the nuclear receptors inside your cells. That's what it is, right? And so when in conventional medicine, allopathic medicine, they think of hypothyroidism starts when the gland gets attacked. That's the end of it. That's like saying that a blood sugar problem happens when you develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease starts when you die of a heart attack, right? Hypothyroid starts at the cellular level. It's a protective mechanism. If you have a bacteria or a virus inside that cell, right? You put a bacteria or virus inside the cell, do you want to increase the metabolism of that cell? Wouldn't make sense, right? Because now you allow that virus to replicate, to double, to, to do what it needs to do. So one of the first things that happens when you have part of a cell danger response is you start to get deactivation of a lot of that, in, that thyroid hormone, that T3, that T4 inside the cell. And when you do that, you get a number of other things that get compromised that we see in our patient base. How many of your patients do you see that are insulin resistant and eat a pretty good diet? Is that possible? Right? How could a guy who trains hard, right, and runs exercise every day, why would I be insulin resistant? I eat good, what was going on? I was creating a cellular stress by over-exercising, right? So we get this cellular stress goes on, and when you have that cellular stress goes on, you get thyroid hormone deactivation. You need thyroid hormone, you need T3 inside your cells to transport 
glucose. So what do your cells become? Insulin resistant, right? So is insulin resistance, is that a mistake? Is that eat too much and I don't exercise enough? Is that mostly what it is? Probably not, right? We all know somebody who doesn't exercise at all, eats all the sugar and candy and crap they want, and guess what? No diabetes, isn't that amazing? And then you have people who are thin, fit, and do a whole bunch of things right, and they are insulin resistant diabetic. Is it a mistake? I think it's a protective mechanism, right? And when Dr. Navio talks about other things like, hey, is depression an abnormal thing? Well, part of the cell danger response is the upregulation of the metabolism of serotonin. Is that important? Yeah. When you metabolize serotonin, what do you get as a byproduct? You get increased H2O2, right? Good, right? The other thing I didn't talk about, if you think about what's happening when you deactivate thyroid hormone and you deionize it, right? You pull an iodine off, what's iodine? Powerful what? Antimicrobial, right? So is that a mistake? Or maybe an important part of the, of the healing, of the protective mechanism, right? So the body is pretty amazing. And then if you look at this paper, even if it takes you like five or six times to go through that paper, I know I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, right? So it took me a bunch of times to read through that paper. I think I've read that paper maybe 10 or 12 times. Every time I read that paper, I pick up another nugget. But one of the easy, one of the most important things, and I, I share this with a lot of people, is we have this interpretation in our world that if we give somebody B6, it's going to do what we want it to do, right? Like we can steer it, right? I have patients tell me all the time, I'm allergic to B6. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Can't take it. It makes this, it does this, or I get whatever. You're not allergic to it. And almost every food you eat, it's in there. What's happening is you're flooding the system with one micronutrient, and you hope it's doing a pathway, right? How many patients do you have that say, I can't take B6, I have an oxalate issue that messes me up, right? You're taking B6 to help you do what you want, but the cells have a whole different interpretation of what they're gonna do. When the cells in fight or flight, it's not in heal and repair. And so we're giving things to maybe our patients or our patients come in with their two bags of supplements and saying, I gotta take all of these because these, I need all of these to feel good, right? If somebody needs two bags of stuff to feel good, they don't need any of them, right? So if you look at this, you'll start to see things like vitamin D, right? In a healthy state, and when life is good, we're in that homeostatic state, we're in growth and development, it goes down one pathway. Vitamin D can be anti-inflammatory, but if you're in a more stress state, cell danger response state, you get increased deactivation of vitamin D. And there, the vitamin D stuff can get even a little bit more complicated than that. I'm not a huge proponent of high dose vitamin D, but uh, all of this stuff, if you take a look, start to take a look at stuff, you know, all of this stuff it changes what's going to happen to it depending on what's happening at the cell. If we're in growth, rebuild, we may get one pathway. If we're under stress, we're gonna go through a different pathway. So pull this paper out. There's a number of things in here and he lays these things out. He doesn't have thyroid hormone necessarily on this sheet, but that's really what's going on. Yeah. So Eric, how do you um, test for cell danger response? Are you doing markers or? So I just, when I look at labs, I'm looking for those markers of inflammation. I'm looking at, I'm looking for multiple markers of inflammation. I'm looking at my patient's symptoms. I'm looking for, I want to see if they look what I call cellular hypothyroidism, okay? Uh, so I may look at their T3 to reverse T3 ratio. I may just look at their reverse T3. Um, you can't even just do that because you have patients, if their T4 is low, then their T, reverse T3 is going to be low, right? <laughs> Um, so you can't just, you have to look at that whole panel and kind of get a concept of what's going on. And if you look at their timeline or their health history, you know this is a person who's under stress.